Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Rethinking Food and Agriculture, featuring Leila Kassam. Leila Kassam has been involved in social change for most of her career. She has worked in the international development sector since 2003, conducting research on poverty and food security for rural development projects in the Global South. Her research has been published in peer-reviewed journals and by international organizations, including the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Leila has an MSc in Development Management from the London School of Economics and a PhD in Development Economics from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She is a co-founder of the Veterinary Vegan Network, Ethical Globe, and Animal Think Tank. She co-edited the anthology Rethinking Food and Agriculture, New Ways Forward, which features a number of well-known writers and activists, including Rupert Sheldrake and Vandana Shiva. The volume contains three articles co-written by Layla, and discussing these was the bulk of our conversation. We talked about the role of animal domestication in the Neolithic Revolution, the concept of misothery, the so-called Green Revolution in 20th century agriculture, alternative paradigms including conservation agriculture, organic agriculture, agroecology, and regenerative agriculture, how the question of either chemicals or animal inputs is a false choice, and the myth of food scarcity. We spent the last third of the interview talking about solutions, how we can make agriculture sustainable and just, which involves not just farming methods, but also systemic, economic, and social changes. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. To support this work financially, you can make a one-time donation to username Colibri at paypal.me or at Venmo. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. You can also become a member at patreon.com slash colibri, where you'll get early access to new episodes, exclusive digital content, and goodies mailed to you. Now here's my conversation with Leila Kassam, who begins with an overview of the book Rethinking Food and Agriculture, and talks about how they assembled such an impressive group of writers. So the book um, is really looking at um, rethinking and and new ways of thinking about the current um, crises that we're facing and the root causes of the multiple interconnected crises that we're facing um, and the role of the food and agriculture system in those crises. Um, And while we're uncovering the roots and the drivers of those crises, um, we also wanted to look at um, what are the potential solutions that people are coming up with. And, um, and so that's where the new ways forward part of the, of the title comes from. So half of the book is devoted to, um, okay, so now we've uncovered some of the roots and driving forces. So what can we do? And there are so many things that people are doing. And we really wanted to highlight some of these ways forward that farmers, scientists, um, thought leaders, et cetera, et cetera, are putting out in the world and having great success with. Um, and in terms of how we managed to gather so many amazing people, I honestly have no idea. Um, I'm it, Really, we've got such big hitters. As you said, Rupert Sheldrake, Vandana Shiva, Helena Norberg-Hodge of Local Futures, Colin Tudge, who in the UK is quite a big name because he um, founded the Oxford Real Farming Conference. Um, Tony Juniper, Hans Herren, who's won a, won a World Food Prize. So the, the list goes on. Um, partly, I think um, it's to do with the fact that my father is very well connected. He's had a long and distinguished career in international development, um, and he's an agriculture expert, um, particularly in conservation agriculture. Um, but many of these um, authors, we, we cold emailed, really, and we okay. told them about the book. Um, and um, gave them an idea of what we wanted them to write about. And most of them, 
yeah, I mean, most of the people that we emailed said yes, first, first time. So it's, yeah, I think we were really lucky. Yeah, well, it's, it's an impressive collection. And uh, I've, I, I used to be a farmer uh, myself. I was a small scale organic farmer in Oregon for a while. And uh, not every farmer reads, you know, theory and these ideas like this, but I always have too. And so I was really impressed by the breadth of everything that was included. There was really a lot that was, that was, that was here uh, from the fairly technical, like the section on the um, uh, gene editing, which really got into the nitty gritty to the more, more philosophical and then the, and then the historical as well. So it really yeah. just quite an amazing, amazing breadth um, within, you know, I would say the, 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 you know, the genre of such books, because there are other, you know, books that have, are anthologies from different authors about agriculture, but this one was pretty, yeah, it was, it was definitely a standout. And so your first section that you uh, authored or co-authored in here was, um, called Agriculture Planted the Seeds of Alienation from Nature. And uh, this one, a lot of the material in this section was familiar to me. Um, I wrote a book, which I, I believe I sent you a copy, right? Um, the Failures of Farming and the Necessity of Wild Tending, in which I went over a lot of the same material, talking about how the transition of the agricultural revolution, the Neolithic revolution, really had a lot of negative effects uh, on our health, um, on our culture, on e equality within culture. Uh, and then of course, you know, uh, most dangerously perhaps with our, our relationship with nature and how we came to dominate everything. But the one, the, the, the aspect that you focused on a lot more that I had not focused on and hadn't given much thought to before was the role of domestication. Uh, of animals in particular. I'd really been thinking about plants mostly in my research. And you say in here, uh, I'm just gonna read a short passage. In reducing other animals to domestication, farmers and herders reduced our animal cousins in general and with them the living world that they had symbolized. Crop conscious farmers saw wild animals as pests and natural elements as threats. But it was the reduction of our animal cousins through husbandry that was the main driver of the radically different worldview that came with the transition from foraging to farming and herding, for it broke up the old totemic ideas of kinship and continuity with the living world. This, more than any other factor, accelerated human alienation from the living world. So I was hoping you'd just talk a little bit about, about this subject. Yeah. Well, so firstly, I should say that this this chapter um, is, you know, the lead author is Jim Mason, and this chapter is based on his phenomenal book that he published in 1993 called An Unnatural Order, oh, okay. uh, Uncovering the Roots of Our Domination of Nature and Each Other. Um, so the majority of this chapter is based on his ideas and his reading. And, and I was listening to a podcast of his um, a few days ago, and he said that he'd spent 12 years reading and writing notes and trying to, um, I mean, because it is a massive subject. Right. Isn't it? And um, so, so yeah. So that's that's the first first caveat. Um, and you're right. So many, you know, there's there's it, it's not hugely controversial. I don't think to talk about the fact that um, you know agriculture in the Neolithic Revolution has had such an impact on us. But focusing on this aspect of domesticating other animals um, and speciesism, um, really, I think it is quite unique. And that's why I really wanted um, Jim's uh, views in this book because I also, I mean, this this intuitively, when I read that book, when, when I read his book, I was like, this, this really feels really, really important. Um, and so, I mean, what you read out is, is a great actual, you know, that's the essence of the chapter. It's this idea that um, when, we were, when we were foragers or um, gatherer hunters, we saw other animals as kindred tribes and they gave us a sense of continuity with nature. Um, and something that Jim brings into his book and also into our chapter is this idea that, our, you know, our animals are good to think in terms of, he draws from um, Paul Shepard's work where, it, you know, we, the way that we think is so influenced um, by other animals. If we think of, of um, children and, and, you know, they're surrounded by other animals in terms of their, their, the growth of their, their, their knowledge. And, and so I think that there's so many things I hadn't thought about 
um, and that were really brought alive for me in his book. Um, and so this idea of moving from foraging where we were, you know, felt were very connected to nature and not from an ideological kind of position, but through our experience of being in and with nature day in, day out. Um, and then having to start domesticating plants and other animals for whatever reason, um, we had to come up with new myths um, and ideologies um, in order to, um, I guess, deal with that tension where we came from this idea that animals were our, were our kin and our cousins and in our creation stories, they were their first being. So they were very powerful in our myths. Um, and then being able to, to square that circle of then dominating them. And then um, something else that, you know, so often people talk about, you know, agriculture and, you know, fine domestication, but it's this idea um, of herding cultures specifically um, and the kind of behaviors and ideology that would, would be necessary for these kinds of, of herding cultures in terms of, well, they were expansionist because they needed to constantly find new grazing land and water. Um, they came from a, you know, they had their hunting skills potentially intact still. So, you know, in terms of militarism, in terms of aggression, all of those sorts of things, the thesis of, of Jim's book is that it's that the sort of the herding culture that really has this connection with our current Western um, worldview and ideology. And I mean, like, I think it's very convincing because we are expansionists. We are, you know, war driven. We are all of all of those sorts of things. So I think to me, it's a very compelling thesis. Yeah, the, that the herding part in particular, I hadn't really put that part together before that the herders would have had this immense effect on on culture and what it was in particular that they would have that they would have brought you know i mean definitely when we settled down and and stopped stopped being sort of migrant on foot you know foraging and 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 came together and, and stayed in one place this definitely changed our relationship you know to place this is when we created property and all this in in that sense you know but then yeah with the herders that obviously was property as well, all these animals. And I suppose the herding probably came a little before the settling down, maybe even. Um, yes, potentially. I mean, and this all, I think, happened over a really long period of time, right. as you right. know, um, you know, but um, and I, as you were speaking, I was just thinking of this piece that I, I think it was so fascinating when I found when I when I found out it's, you know, our concepts of money and capitalism, are all the, the roots are from from, um, you know, I think from like heads of cattle, from ownership of, of these animals, and uh, even the roots of the word pecuniary comes from cattle. And, um, you know, the, 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 I think the old Aryan word for war is like desire for more cattle. So I think this, it, it's, all, it's all so connected to our current system, um, yeah. Right, yes, because I believe, uh, well, capitalism, uh, we know the word decapitate, you know, to remove one's head, right? So we know that 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 word is head, and then, but that head referred to head of cattle, in particular, yeah, right, and coming to us yeah. through the Romans, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they had that 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 phrase, uh, "dolor pecunia radix malorum est." You know, the uh, the uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, is right. is what they is what they said. Yeah, and pecunia, and then we use pecuniary, yeah, and then because you, it was mentioned in the book that that this word pecuniary, that that was a, that actually was a word for cow, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and then you, you, you brought up a word in here that I hadn't seen before. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. Misothery. M-I-S-O-T-H-E-R-Y. Right. Yes. So this is a word that Jim Mason coined in his 1993 book. Um, misothery. I think misothery. Oh, misothery. misothery. Okay. I get it. Well, or, yeah, because it, it's meant to, it's meant to, he made it up uh, right. because he's looking right. for this word. And, and I, I think it's kind of, you know, a bit like misogyny. So when we're right. thinking about, um, and, and so misogyny is sort of literally, you know, women hatred or hatred right. of women. And so he was looking for a word that was really, you know, hatred of nature um, or hatred of, of nature and other animals. Um, and so what misothery, so misothery, misogyny, and then so, 
the relationship between misogyny and patriarchy is kind of the same as the relationship between misogyny and then this system of dominion, d- dominionism, I suppose. Um, I right. think that's where he was coming from with that. Right, right. So that was, he was saying that this was, the, or the way that that word was being used was uh, basically hatred or fear of the other, the other yeah. being, well, anyone who's not human, basically, not a human animal, so any of the other yeah. animals, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that being a new thing, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And then uh, there was talking here about how um, in order to make this transition of having this different relationship uh, with animals, that there were these distancing devices that uh, came into play. And they're distancing devices that we still, that are still current, that we still use uh, to this day. And I've got them listed here. Um, okay. Detachment, concealment, misrepresentation and shifting the blame. And I thought that was, th- th- that was a very interesting section too, because this is kind of the psychology of how it is that we're justifying or not even maybe justifying, but merely living with this different lifestyle that we, that we created that was around the exploitation of animals. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think these distancing devices could probably also be transposed onto us other types of um, ideolo- oppressive ideologies as well in terms of, you know, misrepresentation and, and um, blame shifting, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think this, this really speaks to me in terms of um, how we then and now um, so, so easily, it seems, are able to treat and use and exploit other animals without really thinking about it. Um, and our society supports us in doing these so well um, that it, it's really quite tough to over to even think about overcoming them, to even know, to even be conscious of them. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. There's there's uh, some people refer to this as uh, carnism. Yes. So as being yeah. as being an aspect of our culture that that's here, the idea that uh, meat eating is. Uh, normal and is natural and is therefore good yeah. or healthy or whatever. Yeah. And, and of this and being scary. right. And of this being so um, this being so entrenched in the culture that we don't even realize that it is a belief. Yeah. yeah. Even, no, right. And I think, and I think, and, you know, just coming back again to the, like to the broader, um, the, the, the thing of the book, I really um, wanted to be able to uncover some of these, beliefs that we have internalized um, without knowing it and which our society is set up to kind of keep us in this state of being unconscious of all of these things because I myself have gone through a journey which is never ending of trying to unlearn so much of this stuff Um, and so and to me this is you know our unconsciousness around how we view uh, and our relationship to other animals the flown how we treat them but our relationship to other animals seems to me to be one of the root causes of so many of the issues that we're facing today and most people don't link it to that and that, to me it right. just seems obvious um how, how how prevalent do you see this across um across the human race right now because uh I think we've basically been kind of talking right now with sort of this assumption that we're talking about maybe European cultures and American, you know, and, and the United States, and I suppose other, other quote Western cultures, but is this, it, does this go a bit further? Like, you know, um, I mean, India, for example. I mean, I think, you know, India is a, is interesting because there's, there's also, you know, we think about um, India as being, let's say a predominantly vegetarian society where they, you know, the cow is, um, very revered and yet there is still you know there is just rampant speciesism as well and um, there's a lot of rhetoric and yet you find that um, for example yeah cows who are so revered are also you know just abandoned and etc so I think that the, I, I think that this is this this um, our relationship to other animals might I would say our negative uh, relationship with other animals or or the relationship that I'm trying to bring attention to um, is prevalent in most parts of the world and has different forms. Um, And I think the sort of more indigenous ways of viewing um, nature, even though it might not 
can take the the form that perhaps I would like. I think they're much closer to where I would want us to go and where I think the kind of revolution needs to, in our thinking, um, needs to happen. Right. Do you have right. any thoughts on how prevalent Oh, know, these I mean, how, I, well, I mean, I, you know, I'm most familiar with the United States just because mm -hmm. I, I grew up here and with, with, with you know, um, European and, you know, really mostly even Western or Northern European, I would say even more mm -hmm. than Eastern European. And so I don't, you know, know so much of, I mean, I know that if you look at like South America, for example, there, there's a tremendous amount of beef eating that happens there too. And that's partly why the Amazon is being cut down at such a, a fast mm -hmm. rate, you know, is for is for grazing, you know? Yeah. And, and I also know that, that, you know, I think that per capita, I believe the United States is still pretty much at top, isn't it? For, yes. for yes, as, it as is. meat eating. So like, this is yeah. kind of the, and this is really the, I, I don't want to say the belly of the beast, but, but you know, this is the, really yeah. the, <laughs> that this is, this is really kind of ground zero in, in, in some ways, yeah. you know? And then, and then there's yeah. sort of the, there's also these ideas and you didn't mention this in the book. I'm just kind of thinking of it now, but, but there's, there's these ideas that uh, connect um, mediating and class, you know, yeah. so that, so that, uh, yeah. you know, that, that, that a way of showing that one is wealthy is by, by eating more meat or that meat eating is associated with wealth. And so, you know, yeah, I think so. There's, there's a few things in what you're saying that, that things are coming up for me. Firstly, um, what you're saying about um, Latin America or South American countries being, um, you know, high in meat eating. So much of that came with colonization. Right. Um, right. Okay. And I think also this thing about um, uh, meat eating being um, linked to class. Again, I think this has always been the case because um, eating other animals is so resource inefficient and it's always right. been something that's sort of the affluent uh, um, and, and now, it's, you know, it's a status kind of symbol, you know, eating steak rather than hamburgers or whatever. Um, yeah, so I, th I think there's, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of um, narrative um, and sort of ideological stuff that, that's entangled with this. Um, yeah. 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 And then it's interesting too, because here we're sort of dancing around the idea too of, 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 well, that uh, we, we can see that domestication of animals was a negative thing in so many ways for the animals, for the planet, for mm -hmm. us, you know, uh, then uh, we can see that there's differences between these colonial cultures that came out of the agricultural revolution and some of these uh, indigenous cultures that that were wiped out or in some cases still exist. And so then that starts to raise some questions because like a couple of the people I've interviewed or, or, or know um, uh, as part of my writing of this podcast are Native Americans who uh, there's a different relationship there with, with animals and with hunting that uh, it has to do with, well, first of all, there's not a domestication factor, at least in mm -hmm. the, so like, let's look at like, just say Western United States, there's not a domesticating factor. And then there's a set of rituals about that are reflecting connection to that creature that are, are asking, you know, to take a creature that uh, uh, no is an answer that can be given. And so it's not necessarily that it always taken. And so uh, I don't know, it, it could be that that discussion isn't even, isn't it isn't terribly relevant in in the terms of the case that it's really just an exception to a rule but i always find that it starts to come up around the edges of these conversations because yeah. it is it is it is a very different way of looking at things yes and i do and you know and and reading your book um and and you know this this idea of of we need needing to move to a more indigenous worldview like i'm 100 percent on board with that and i feel like we didn't bring that out so much in this book and hopefully as things progress you know um we'll find a way to do that um and at the same time i would say that um well i know jim mason would say that you know the ritual um and and things that go along with you know hunting um in in some of these cultures are, are again mechanisms to deal with that guilt etc oh. um and but my you know i would say also that my primary sort of um focus is not on those edge cases and and you know indigenous cultures and etc it's really to me um western industrial colonial um imperialist cultures and 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 what we're doing to the planet basically like i think that that's more than enough to be focusing on oh yeah i mean me. certainly and, for and, me and, and, right oh no i i hear you and in terms of yeah. and in terms of the 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 you know the multiple crises that the planet is facing you know 
um, that's where the, that's where the issue is with right. the ninety nine percent of the of the human population that is no longer living an indigenous you know a traditional indigenous life yeah. way you know yeah. like that so um, and I also I I also feel like I should say that you know um the the when we have these discussions those other animals are not present at the table they're right. not here in our podcast they're not here and um, when we're having our philosophical conversations and if they right. were um i think they would be very different conversations right right i think that's a very good point yeah. to make yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> yeah definitely and the next section that you that you co-wrote um it's called paradigms of agriculture and here you're discussing um the so-called green revolution mm-hmm. and its sort of its effects and then some different um, paradigms that are alternatives to the Green Revolution. So first, maybe you could just uh, briefly talk about what the Green Revolution was, because uh, with the word green, how it has a meaning now, that sounds like a good thing, but but obviously the Green Revolution was not, so. (laughs) No, it really wasn't. So um, I co-wrote this with my father, who, as I said, is is an expert in in sustainable agriculture. and so, okay, so the Green Revolution refers to um, a set of um, agricultural research, development and, and technology transfers that happened between the sort of 1940s and 1970s. Um, and it was really about developing a package of hybrid sort of new high yielding variety. I'm putting this in, in air quotes, high yielding varieties, um, that, you know, that would work well with agrochemicals and irrigation that needed fossil fuels. Um, and these, um, high yielding, well, the uh, original research was um, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation in Mexico. Um, and then through that, um, they set up, um, I think, 13 international agricultural research centers, which are called the CGIAR system today. Um, and, you know, cover uh, it's global and, and very much involved in a lot of the agricultural uh, research um, and, and and direction of agricultural development today. And the Green Revolution was really, if you look at it, the way that industrial agriculture was spread to globally and the, and the sort of the global south. Um, and we think, and there's a narrative around it that it, um, that it increased yields and it saved you know, a billion people from hunger. And, um, you know, even uh, it, it's, it's the dominant model today in terms of industrial agriculture and it's the dominant model that's being promoted by so-called development institutions globally still despite the rather uncontroversial environmental impacts that it has had Um, and then you know there's contested um, theories and things around the actual impacts on yields Um, but there's um, some recent literature that's come out sort of revisionist history showing that actually those yield increases um, were more narrative than rhetoric than actually than 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 real um yeah that's particularly interesting because uh to, to find out that the, the yields weren't so much higher like they said that, that they were yeah and i think i mean uh, we've only really touched you know touched the surface of of that um re- uh, rethinking of that narrative and really i think the focus for us was um, to show what some of the driving forces were. So we're talking about the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation. We're talking about this sort of corporate model being spread to the global south, um, a narrative that's not quite what it seems, um, but a narrative that's still being used to spread this model um, to, you know, small scale African farmers um, who, you know, and and um, and the other thing that we really wanted to, to highlight, I think, was... Um, the environmental impacts um, of this model um, in terms of soil degradation, in terms of, um, you know, aquifers, in terms of pollution, in terms of, um, you know, being totally um, irrelevant to small scale farmers in own innovations and development strategies and totally inappropriate um, in so many ways. Right. Yeah. One element that you brought out in here that I hadn't given so much thought to before, because when I thought of the green revolution, revolution, I thought, you know, first of the hybrids, 
you know, the hybridization, the new crops, you know, the uh, increasing use of chemicals, the, you know, increase in mechanization. But I hadn't thought about the fact that it was also bringing, uh, that it was also a, a specifically capitalist thing and that it was bringing particular economic model to bear on farming as well, the uh, one component of which is going into debt. Yes. And I mean, th- I mean, the <laughs> Debt is so much a part of the, the this corporate industrial model that keeps us all, you know, in chains basically right. and doing what you know the that we're meant to and not. And and when we think about what's happened in India, which was the sort of heartlands of of um, the uh, the green revolution, you know, I think three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide drinking right. that same very same pesticide that they have been, you know, um, that has been pushed on them since nineteen ninety five. Due, to, due fundamentally to indebtedness. So this model um, is a, an input intensive model, which means that you, you know, that you need to buy your agrochemicals, you need to buy hybrid seeds when you, you know, as farmers, you've been, you know, uh, um, producing and saving your own seeds through generation and generation, um, which are adapted to local conditions. And the, I mean, there's so many, there's just so many problems with this model. I don't feel like, I, yeah, I can, yeah, anyway. <laughs> right. Oh, so conservation agriculture, you mentioned, that's one of the yeah. alternatives that you mentioned. And um, I mean, on the face of it, conservation agriculture, that sounds like a good thing, but I believe that you were, um, somewhat critical of it as well or our aspects of it or certain methods yeah so um so the second part of of this chapter we wanted to look at what are the what are alternative paradigms um that could be um you know ways forward and so we we looked at four and one of them was conservation agriculture um and so conservation agriculture, for those who don't know, is based on three principles um, of, of minimum soil disturbance, which basically means no till, um, coupled with um, permanent soil cover, so mulch and cover crops, and then div- diversified um, crop- cropping systems. And those are the sort of three principles on, on which you can then have locally adapted um, practices, and then they will take different forms in different places. Um, and I think the 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 I, I, one of the the things that we did say is that if we want to be truly ecological and sustainable, um, having or moving towards organic or biological systems is really important. And conservation agriculture, out of those four alternative paradigms, doesn't insist on being organic. Um, and I think, but then when you look at you know paradigms like organic agriculture, um, which tills the soil and has also been co-opted in many ways. And, you know, in terms of actually some some of the systems being uh, organic versions of conventional industrial kind of mindset, um, you know, it's organic doesn't equal sustainable either. So I think um, that that's kind of, I think what we were trying to bring out. So all of these different paradigms, conservation agriculture included, um, has um, has definitely turned back towards nature, you know, compared to the conventional paradigm, but has all of them have a way to go, I think, to be truly ecologically sustainable. Right. Yeah. And the four that you mentioned, I'll just mention all four of them now, mm-hmm. since I think mm-hmm. discussing one tends to run into the other uh, as organic agriculture, agroecology, regenerative agriculture and conservation agriculture. And mm-hmm. going back to conservation agriculture there for a moment and no till, um, definitely I've, I've heard people often bring up no-till and, and sustainable agricultural cir- circles, you know, and one thing that I know about, it, about, about no-till is it doesn't necessarily mean no chemicals at all. So I, I was born and raised in Nebraska in the middle of the country, kind of the breadbasket of the, of the U.S. there. And I, w- I heard about no-till there growing up, but no-till they were doing because, they realized that soil erosion was a big, was a big problem, you know, and, and yeah. that it was in their interest not to have that happen. But no-till just meant heavy herbicide use there right. to get rid of weeds. And so uh, just no-till all by itself is not, yeah, is not a good thing. I mean, that's, that's only one component. Yes, no, absolutely. And I think um, often people mix up no-till with conservation agriculture um, and 
you know, conservation agriculture is a system and it needs all of those principles and just having, you know, no-till and then heavy herbicide use is really not um, at all. But yeah, there's a lot of confusion about that. And often it gets asked, um, you get asked about that. Yeah. Right. And then, so the three components you're talking about in conservation agriculture were, first of all, no-tilling. Secondly, um, keeping the ground covered yeah. with a mulch or a, or a, or a living mulch. And yes. then the, the third part was... Um, was the third Diversific- Diversified cropping Diversification, system. right. Okay, so... so right. Association, sequencing. Um, right, okay. And does that have to do with monocropping, like not monocropping specifically? Yes. Is that, so, so a polyculture. Yes. Right? Right. Well, so you can... Well, I suppose if you're doing rotation... Yeah, rotations or association. So, yes, yeah, so not, not okay. having a... Mo- so having a... Di- basically, it's having a d- diversified system, whatever that might be, because if you've got a small plot of land, maybe it will be different from if you've got a larger plot, what you can do in terms of diversity. Right, yeah. right. But one could do this and still have 40 acres of corn one year and then yeah. 40 acres of beans the next yeah. or, or whatever. Okay, yeah. so so it would still allow for that kind of, uh, that aspect of it. Yes, I think so. Right. Okay, so and organic agriculture, that's where, that's that's the, what I was really involved in doing. And I was um, in Oregon at the time, which is a great place to be a farmer. It's a great climate it doesn't get too hot it doesn't get too 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 cool there's a there's the maritime influence and uh while i was there i met some of the pioneers of the organic movement um in the united states who were some of the people who were were developing it back in the 70s uh Mm -hmm. there some of the kind of the back to the land hippie types actually who then in the 70s uh formed you know came up with these ideas um and then they helped form oregon tilth which was one of the first became is now a certifying agency, but it was one of the first, here's what organic means. It was for certifying local people in Oregon is what it was mm-hmm. so that you couldn't just use the word organic unless you were doing particular things. Right. Yeah. And so from their standpoint, organic agriculture was really based um, uh, on, on sort of soil health or their idea of yeah. soil health first and, and foremost, you know? And so uh, one of the ways that, um, you mentioned that the, or, the organic, the label has been watered down. And, and one way in which it has is that recently in the United States, I believe the, the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, which um, uh, they're the ones who, who uh, administer the, the organic program, um, decided to allow uh, hydroponics in some cases. Right. So it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> so, so organics based on soil, but uh, or, uh, hydroponic is... <laughs> No soil. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? How everything gets co-opted in the end. Right. Um, it's right. Yeah. And sad. Yeah. yeah. So when I knew these farmers ten years ago, they were already talking about, okay, we need to come up with a new label and a new way of certifying because yeah. organic has has sort of ceased to 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 mean much yeah. of anything, yeah. you know, at, at this point. And one place that I've I've seen that in particular is um. Uh, in Southern California in the desert, they've got vast fields, you know, being irrigated, you know, out there of organic produce. And it's, I remember one day seeing these two dump trucks driving out onto the main highway from the fields. Both of them were loaded to the top with carrots. One was labeled organic only on the back and the other one wasn't. And I was like, well, (laughs) how different is the treatment that these two carrot crops are getting? (laughs) Right. And they're both just being grown here in the middle of the desert, which doesn't seem, oh you know, sustainable either. So, so regenerative agriculture, this is another one. I, I've been hearing this term a lot more like the last yes. year or two. I don't know why it is that it's become trendy to talk about it. And in some cases, it seems like when people are talking about regenerative agriculture, they're talking about um, a system which is focused on the use of, of animals. So mm-hmm. I was hoping you could talk about what this means to you. Well, I mean, I, I, the same um, as you in terms of, yeah, I've also been hearing it more and more in the last few years. Um, and so they've got some good PR behind them, clearly. Um, and I've also, you know, when we, were, when we were doing research into what do all these different, par- you know, what are, the, what are the definitions of these different paradigms and what do they mean? It's like there is no actual, you know, agreed upon definition of regenerative agriculture. And often, you know, people are kind of, I, I don't know, I feel like they're slapping the label of regenerative agriculture agriculture onto vastly different um, production systems but yes I think so I think they borrow and we we put some of the definitions that are out there in the chapter um, and you know we, one of the things is that you know they borrow a lot from the 
um, conservation agriculture in terms of, you know, thank, you know, thank goodness they were focusing on like or reducing tillage, if not completely no no till, um, and you know permanent soil cover and those sorts of things. So there is a focus on soil health. Um, but where it differs from conservation agriculture is there does seem to be this focus also on on grazing and the sort of Alan Savory uh, mob grazing or holistic grazing approach um, as well, um, which, yeah, I'm not so, um, th there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of, of evidence for, for that, um, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that, um, you know, from farmers that it's brought their land back, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure of the truth of any of those things. Um, holistic and, grazing, you mean? Yes, holistic grazing. And, right. and I would also say, regardless of whether, um, you know, I think a lot of the comparisons, it's like, oh, well, holistic grazing is better than what? What are you comparing it to? Um, are you comparing it to conventional industrial tillage based agriculture in terms of benefits? Or are you comparing it to um, in terms of, you know, um, sustainability or green uh, being able to sequester carbon, which is often the, one of the, the main arguments? Uh, or are you comparing it to, you know, conservation agriculture systems, which usually they're not. So um, I think there's um, yeah, there's there's a bit of confusion around that for me. Um, but regardless, I think this narrative that um, having domesticated animals by default in your systems is necessary for sustainability is one which I think is a myth. And um, yeah, um, but I'm not I'm you know I'm I'm not an um, agronomist or I don't have an agriculture background. I'm a social scientist, so I um, rely on my my father's expertise for a lot of this and wanted to put a lot of that into this book because I wanted us to, to, to bust some of these myths as well. Right. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the part there about the need for animals in agriculture, because let's see, here, here's, here's how it got put in the book. The, di the dichotomy that is promoted by some alternative agriculture paradigms of the need for either manure or chemical fertilizer is misleading. And this is definitely something I ran into um, in hanging out with, uh, or, you know, with organic farmers. And in that scene was that, that's it. It's a choice between, that's it. You're either using chemicals or you're using animals and that's it. Yeah, and and I think this is one of those those sort of myths or narratives or dichotomies, which is it's false, and it means that you know it really sort of shuts down um, the idea that you can have, let's say, a veganic approach to agriculture, and it really makes sort of you know uh, oh well we would we would we would be vegan, but the thing is that we need this for sustainability. So suddenly it's like oh well, you're anti sustainability, and actually it's it's there is a third way, um, and conservation agriculture shows organic conservation agriculture shows that you that there is a third way and 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 probably the sort of more original you know of your friends your back to the land hippies from the 70s or no actually sorry um other types of organic sorry i'm gonna have to cut this <laughs> i've gone off um what i meant to say is that organic successful organic conservation agriculture system shows that there is a third way that you that you don't have to use manure and you don't have to use chemicals um and you can still um have sustainable production systems right uh, and, and right. just to also to add it's um it's this idea that um you know we need animals to basically um process biomass when when actually we can cut out that middle man or person um, and let the soil um, and, and soil biota and, 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 and earthworms do basically the same thing. Um, yeah. Right. So, so that's kind of moving in the direction now of talking about um, agroecology, which yeah. um, was kind of what you were presenting as being the, the, the best uh, of these. Or did I, did I not read that? Well, right? Oh, that's interesting. That that's what that's what you that that's what came out for you. I mean, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what agroecology is, because oh, the term is well, kind of new to me, and I think oh, a lot of people haven't heard it. So, okay, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, agroecology um, is. I mean, again, it's one of these um, things that doesn't actually have a common definition. And in some places it will have four principles, and other places it will have thirteen principles. Um, but I think. Um, it, it's really based on this. It's a sort of science of, of, of using 
um, you know, ecological and biological processes and mimicking those in our agroecosystems um, and principles of diversity and nutrient cycling. And, you know, they, I think agroecological systems are also organic. Um, and so, you know, many of these good sort of practices um, and in the food and environmental movements, agroecology um, is, is, is quite um, sort of the, the thing that a lot of people think that we need to shift to. Um, and agroecology as well, you know, it's defined as a science, a set of practices, but also more recently as a movement. Um, and I think for, for, for us, this, the, the movement aspect especially is, is really interesting because it's this idea that um, we, you know, even if we, well, for, this is from my perspective, even if we have like the best agricultural paradigm, if we are still um, situated within the corporate food regime and a capitalist food system, it's, it's not going to make, it's still going to get co-opted, it's still going to be driven in, in uh, a direction that we don't want. Um, and so agroecology in the, in the large a sense of a science of practice and a movement um, is really about um, challenging the corporate food regime and demanding things like food sovereignty, land justice, seed sovereignty, localization, etc. etc. So I think in in the book or in the chapter, um, we try to be as unbiased or objective um, as possible with all of those different paradigms. And um, with the idea, and, and I'm sure we'll get to this and, and when we look at um, the, the last chapter or the concluding chapter of the book, is that um, that we, we need to take the best bits from all of them, or at least that's what we're arguing for. So the sort of the ecological um, underpinnings that come with conservation agriculture, plus the movement aspect, the challenging of the corporate food regime um, and integrating with those movements like the Via Campesina and the international peasant movement that's, uh, that's demanding these things. Um, you know, we need to have both of those things and more. Again, so, so again, we're talking about not just not just agricultural methods or philosophies, but yeah. the structures, yeah. the economies and the cultures that come come with them. Exactly. And I think um, maybe this is what you're picking up from from the from the chapter is that, you know, agroecology with a big A, you know, mm -hmm. science practice and movement is the only one of these paradigms that really is um trying to challenge those structures or actually highlighting the importance of those structures and cultures etc in in shifting the paradigm to something which is more sustainable and just so the last chapter was called towards inclusive responsibility yeah and here's where you're sort of tying it all up and i don't know if i want to say it. well i mean you're kind of offering this is kind of where you're offering your solutions too yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we were left <laughs> with the task of trying to distill or trying to yeah tie things up um, of a massive book with all these amazing insights. Um, but we did find that there were these recurring themes that kept coming up in different chapters. So that's kind of how we started. So we um, talked about um, you know this. There were, well, we distilled six themes basically um, from the preceding chapters. Um, which I can, shall I go through them briefly? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the first one is um, this idea of moving towards more holistic paradigms and mindsets. So quite a few of the chapters were really quite critical of the current um, scientific um, sort of reductionist, mm -hmm. mechanistic right. uh, model of nature, which is, you know, um, which, which impact, you know, just like all of these paradigms that we're in and that we're unconscious of, you know, um, really impact um, and are a, a root cause of where we where we are. Um, and so shifting to more holistic ways of thinking and knowing more traditional indigenous non expert ways of knowing um, and viewing nature rather than as a machine, but as organic and interconnected and alive. Um, and included in that is also, you know, this idea of, of of reconnecting or learning from nature and and that includes other animals and shifting our relationship to be you know our anthropocentric and our hum human supremacist worldviews and shifting that um so that's that's the first um theme of towards holistic paradigms and mindsets um the second is a, a second theme that came up a couple a few times in the chapters um and which really is um the basis of our economic system as an as an economist i can i can tell you this is one of the first things i learned about economics which is that it's based on scarce allocating scarce resources right. so it's um so the, the the second theme was about shifting us from a narrative of scarcity um i.e we don't we don't have enough food to feed people um etc etc 
to a narrative of, of abundance. And as um, one of the chapters in the book showed that this narrative of like not having enough food um, based on these models of these international organizations are really misleading. Um, um, so, and the idea that we, we can't really shift um, and find these these big solutions if we're still in this emergency kind of crisis mode of like a scarcity we need to kind of yeah move towards abundance um right. the third we've talk, oh, talked before, a lot before about before we move on oh, uh, yeah if you don't mind th this this is um i just wanted to pause for a moment on this one because the whole idea that there's not enough food that one's really that one's really built in like people really believe that like oh there's not enough food oh we need to like put more land under farming oh there's you know like this one comes up over and over again uh and yet there is a, a tremendous amount of food wastage uh that happens all around the world too which seems to that all by itself seems to show that there is enough absolutely and then if if you broaden your definition of waste in terms of what we put through animals um that that right. increases the you know in the the waste even more so yeah i mean it's a great narrative for the corporate sector isn't it oh we need gmos and we need agrochemicals and we need this that and the other because we don't have enough food and without it you know poor people are going to starve and 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 that that is how the narrative is being used it's the kind of justification for all of these um high tech or you know the, um, interventions that make a lot of money for a, for a small group of corporations um yeah, yeah. It's and, kind of and, a, go ahead no i was going to say and, and and it's it's interesting as well to to see how the sort of development organizations you know that's the world that i've been part of and have left um because of things like this um you know there, there's models uh, the model that that's analyzed in the book is the model by the FAO and IFPRI and other organizations use these similar models that show that you know we, we've got this scarcity and so it's like our development organizations academia the corporate sector all kind of um you know saying this the same sort of thing and it's it, it's not true I mean just simple maths and we'll show you that it's not true um we, we look at how much food that we produce and waste and put um, and feed to animals etc cetera, etc cetera. we've got more than enough food to feed 10 billion people right i mean but so so there's like this spirit of desperation or fear really that that is is put out there as part of that you know oh we yeah. don't have enough oh we have to keep making more and you mentioned gmos and i just wanted to, to to point out that that when it comes to genetically modified food crops that you know this is always the first thing they say is oh we need higher yields but mm -hmm. then what they don't mention is that there's very few if any uh gmo crops that have actually been uh, um, engineered for higher yields. yields. Yes, I know. Isn't that well? It's not, it's not what saying, it's isn't done. That hilarious. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It is ridiculous. Yeah. No. No. So, I mean, to me, anyway, which way you look at it, this is a narrative that is being right. used to sell certain solutions. And if we are fearful, it's we're much, you know, we're much more. Uh, it's much easier to sell these solutions, and people don't really think too much about it. Right. Right. I mean, I guess you could sum it all up as in that the, the problem isn't with supply. The problem is with distribution. Yeah. 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 And that has to do with power structures and, and yes, you know, absolutely. economies uh, more than it has to do with practicalities or logistics. Yes, absolutely. And I think if you look at, um, I don't know if you read, there's a chapter three, I think it is on the corporate food regime. I think that gives a really great insight into the structural um, the structural causes and also then and something that we didn't look deep enough at in the book and I really wish that we we'd had the space to but really this idea that we um, you know we have a capitalist food system right. um, which artificially creates scarcity in some areas and overprodu overproduction in others and this is inherent in the system um, you know it's inherent and um, so we really really need to shift to post-capitalist um, modes of, of production and consumption and organizing ourselves which is a which is another book but anyway <laughs> oh absolutely i agree i mean i you know I, I would like to see food entirely demonetized absolutely i mean it's a commodity for goodness sake i know you should be yeah. a right um yeah yeah that and that housing and healthcare, all just and education just yeah. none of that should be in an area of monetization. well let, let's have money for the people who need to buy diamond rings and sports cars and they can use them for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> So then, uh, let's see, part three, uh, or the, the third oh, yeah. part, I believe, um, uh, yeah. 
towards ecological and multifunctional paradigms of agriculture? Yeah, so we we did just um, we talked about that around conservation agriculture, etc. Right. So it's this idea that we need to move away from the industrial green revolution paradigm of agriculture um, towards much more e- ecological and multifunctional. And this idea of multifunctional is um, is also something that people talk about a lot. So um, agriculture isn't just about producing food; it also has you know it has other um, important aspects in terms of our ecosystem um, functions and landscape and watershed health and functions, as well as you know adapting and mitig- adapting to and mitigating um, climate change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's there's so much that agriculture does. So it's multifunctional. So we need to focus on those types of paradigms that can tick all of those boxes. Okay, so that so that instead of being a source of damage, that it can be a source of uh, rejuvenation one might say or yes even restoration yes. to some degree yeah i mean it's it's coming back to being regenerative which is you know and 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 being able to harness all of those um sort of biological and ecological processes that that nature you know nature provides us with so much and i think um being able to do our agriculture in the way that is not damaging those cycles and is actually supporting those cycles is really i mean it's it's a massive part of you know, where we need to go if we're going to address these crises. Right. And that necessarily is going to be small scale or, or at least very localized. Yeah. I mean, and yes. Uh, well, I think, oh, sorry, can you say what's going to be, it's going to be localized. Agriculture. Agriculture. Would have to be, you know, well, well small scale is one, one thing that oh, we I often see. talk about. Yes. And then, yeah. So, you know, it, you're not having, you know, you know, these, these enormous, Play, you know, like like where it's a cornfield to the horizon, right. or, you yes. know, or whatever, yeah. you know. And and actually, that that sort of um, gets us to the the next um, okay. theme, mm-hmm. um, which is about decentralizing. Oh, there we go. Mm-hmm. Um, um, power in the food and economic system. So it's um, it's it's what we talked about in terms of agroecology as a movement, in terms of right. developing right. alternatives to the corporate food regime and decentralizing power, wealth, and resources away from the corporate sector back down to the grassroots. And um, you know that that's going to include. So, so one of the chapters is on is on localization, and in this this idea that we we as a system now we are biased towards the large scale and the global, and we need to, and that's a massive part. I mean, globalization is a massive massive part of of the problems that we're facing. So shifting towards the small scale and the local um, is a really important part um, of of a, a future um, food and economic system. Um, and related to that is also this move away from, you know, this depoliticized um, sort of corporate claim that you will hear from, you know, the, the same people who, you know, promote GMOs, et cetera, of food security, which doesn't say anything about where that food has come from or um, towards this idea of food sovereignty, um, which is, um, you know, about the right of, of, of people to define their own food and agriculture system and the, the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecological means. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think it's, it's lots of different ways to decentralize power, but that needs to be done for sure. Right. So a right not just to food, but to actually to, to healthy and sustainably raised food. Exactly. And, and, and d- yeah, d- democratizing control over our food system. So, right. um, we, yeah, exactly. We, we should have the right to define what our food system looks like, not the big corporations. Um, and yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause it honestly is just a, a, a small handful of people at this point. And, and that, that was one aspect of the green revolution, obviously too, because uh, there were a lot more smaller farms and a lot more local localized uh, mm-hmm. systems even 50 mm-hmm. years ago than there are now, you yeah. know, yeah. like uh, yeah. one I thing, mean, go ahead. No, no, go on, you can Oh, just one, one thing that back, back in Oregon in the, in the Willamette Valley there, where I was, I knew some of these um, uh, organic farmers, one thing that they were getting going was uh, the Willamette Valley grain and bean project. And so what they were doing was trying to get farmers there to grow staple crops again. So, you know, grow grains like, you know, wheat or oats or millet or quinoa, you know, anything like that. And then the legumes, because those kinds of crops have become uh, 
just the territory of the large corporations and of the huge farms, you know, and, but those also represent uh, calorically the majority of the diet, the, the, right. the beans and, and the grains do. And so he was really wanting to, to the, 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 the farmer I knew, uh, Harry McCormick, who had put this project together and working with other farmers, they were trying to relocalize that again. And part of that was getting silos set up again like had been set up before local systems of just storing it. So some of those systems were no longer even in place at this point. So really um, what, what we were seeing was that uh, a lot of things just had to be kind of like a lot of really basic things, including just where to put the grains had to be rebuilt at this point. Right. So the basic infrastructure, the basic yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. 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 And they were having some success there and you could go to the local co-op and you could get the local wheat I don't know, out of the, out of the bulk bin and then you could run it through a grinder and make flour right there. It was great, you know, but I haven't seen that anywhere else, but so then uh, the next part, oh, what's, what's the next one? Okay. So um, the fifth theme is, um, shifting towards diets which promote human and planetary health okay. um, and so you know in the in the book um we talk about um you know the corporate food system promoting um western diet patterns which are high in processed um processed food and sugar salt oil and animal-based foods right. and low in nutritious plant foods um and so you know there's a there's a huge amount of scientific and clinical evidence that shows that shifting towards a plant-based diet is is um healthy for us is, is one of the healthiest diet patterns for us and you know we're facing a an epidemic of lifestyle diseases heart disease obesity etc cetera, etc cetera, which are directly related to you know our diet patterns um, and then also you know in terms of planetary health as well we, when we think about you know the animal agric animal agriculture and what it's doing um, to the planet um, so an added bonus if we were to shift um, towards plant-based diets would be that the vast amount of land that's currently used for animal agriculture that could be restored to um, you know, natural vegetation through rewilding, ecological restoration, et cetera. Yeah, no, um, I, go ahead. Yeah. It's a tremendous no, no, no. amount of land. And, and most people aren't aware of what a tremendous amount of, in the United States, the amount of farmland used for raising food for animals is more than the area of land used to, to grow food directly for people, you know? Yes. And, and then the amount that's used for grazing animals uh, rangeland, you know, they call it is larger, is much larger than both of those, you know, put together and just the immense damage that's done to lands, a lot of which are considered wild because they're not being farmed. So, you know, they're not city land, they're not farmland. Oh, it's wild, you know, but then you go out to these lands where they're being grazed and like, well, these are not intact ecosystems, no. you know, where cows or sheep have been, you know, grazing over them. And in some areas they've been grazing over them for, you know, a couple of centuries at this point, you know? And so we don't even know what's missing out of the ecosystem at this, at, yeah. at this point. But, but I think that that's something that most people don't realize is just the tremendous footprint uh, just in sheer real estate that's taken up by, by animal agriculture and, and all the natural, or all the wild systems that then get excluded, you know, because of yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think this, you know, land is so central to so much of, of what we're talking about. And then we, if we're using um, that land for animal agriculture, um, you know, what is the opportunity cost in, in all sorts of in the, all, all the other things that it could be be used for um, and I think you're, you're absolutely right because it's a shocking percentage it's like two-thirds of, of the land I think globally in terms of farmland is used for yeah. animal agriculture and then including you know feed production um, in what's being called you know a meat grab it really does feel like it's like land grabbing but it's it's, it's been called this meat grab which I think is a great term um, and I think yeah, I, I really think that this is such a massive part of, of what needs to shift. Yeah, well, because that's all habitat loss is what that is. Yeah. And we know that habitat loss is one of the main drivers of the great number of extinctions that we're seeing right yes. now in both animal yeah. and plant populations around yeah. the world. Yes, and it's, yeah, exactly. And it's not controversial to, to say because there's so much science behind it that animal agriculture is the leading cost of, uh, cause of habitat um, destruction. So it's all... It's, it's so connected. Um, yeah, it seems a shocking yeah. way to organize ourselves. I feel like in the United States, the, the, the only way to change this is to, is to get um, 
is is to change the the, the structure of, of subsidies and, and policy yeah. at the federal level because right now that's who's being supported and the small yeah. stuff isn't being supported. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's a it's not an accident or a natural evolution of, of human nature or whatever that we've ended up in this situation. We need serious structural change. Um, you know, the, the corporate food regime is a handful of, of organizations that create the rules for all of this, that set the price of grain, that, that um, you know, that drive um, farmers into either animal agriculture or feed production. And we need, yeah, those, those structural changes have a, uh, will, will have a massive impact. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we need really powerful social movements in order to demand those changes, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because they're making because, a lot of money for us, you know, for, for an economic and political elite. Yeah, and they're not operating, you know, you know, people in the United States like to talk about the free market and <laughs> capitalism. It's like, well, there that's not no a free market. No, 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 that's not, they're not operating in that world. No, no. <laughs> no they're being supported. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then what's the, the final uh, paradigm? Okay, so the, far, uh, the final um, theme or is theme, sorry. Mm -hmm. yes, is is, um, is yeah, is this idea that we need um, social movements right. <laughs> um, to make. Right. You know, they've been central to social change in the past, and um, you know, we and, and especially things like mass protest, civil disobedience, direct action. Um, but it's not just um, you know uh, mass protest that needed that's needed. There's this whole uh, there's this idea of a social movement ecology um, with different groups and individuals and organizations with different theories of how to make change working you know doing their thing but working sort of synergistically like it's all needed the the mass protest movements to shift public opinion but then you know those same protesters are not going to be the ones that are going to be able to actually codify these into legislation so the ngos and those organizations who you know they're, they're all needed and then the people making change and creating alternatives um, and then, you know, there's also personal transformation. So people who are, um, you know, trying to live more lightly on the earth, et cetera, et cetera. Like all of that is needed um, if we want transformative change. But we have, so we really need to reclaim our power to make change. I think most of us feel very disempowered um, and we give away our power with our obedience and our cooperation and we need to take it back. Um, otherwise, we're, we really are going to be sleepwalking off a cliff. Right, right. And, and I would just add that this isn't, um, none of this is partisan either, you know? I mean, when, when it comes down to these issues of like, mm -hmm. let's, you know, feed ourselves better, let's have more control over our local communities, let's have healthier ecosystems, let's have a, a, a better chance of there being a tomorrow, you know, for the next generation, that these are not issues of, of, of you know, uh, uh, of Tory or liberal or, or Republican or Democrat or, or anything like that. And I think that when you talk to people one-on-one -on -one, um, that you can find these, you can, you can find these commonalities. Oh, absolutely. I mean, in the, you know, in this age of social media and polarization, we, we seem to forget that actually some of these basic things are so common to us and we all we all need healthy food and environments and etc cetera, etc cetera, and, and, a, and a healthy planet to live on um so yeah 100 percent agree um, and we need to unite across our differences we need to have the courage to do that quite frankly yeah. yeah 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 so um one thing that you mentioned at the very end of that last section was uh, this is the phrase I was looking for before that I lost. Um, conservation, agriculture. So conservation, agriculture oh, yeah. based, veganic agroecology. So that's kind of where maybe you were <laughs> outlining what, um, and that's a mouthful, but that's kind of where you were yeah. outlining maybe your picture of, yes. of what you were seeing as, as a, a good system or yeah. approach. So Yes. So um, there's, a, there's a little bit that I just wanted to say before that. So what we did in that last chapter, well, Actually, in our introduction, we'd come up with this idea of, of, a, of a responsible food system, what it would look like. And then we wanted it to be inclusive, um, inclusive of other animals, inclusive of the planet, um, like fully inclusive, even though that word is so overused these days. Um, but um, so, so we, we distilled these six themes and then we thought, OK, well, what, what does this how does this inform now what we think an inclusively responsible food and agriculture system would look like and we thought um actually similar to what you were saying about all of these things being non-partisan we thought about universal human values because 
um, we were thinking about the, how the current system is really, it's, it's based on values, but it's based on values that we don't agree with, like competition and colonization. And maybe that's not a value, but you, you know what I mean. Things like, right. you know, racism, patriarchy, extraction, exploitation, um, and these myths of, of, yeah, competition and individualism. And, and we want, you know, whatever alternative system that we create needs to be based or underpinned by an alternative ethical framework. At least that's, that's, that's our right. argument anyway. Right. Um, life supporting systems rather than, you know, systems that destroy life. Um, and so we thought of values such as inclusion and justice and equity and care. And so we thought, OK, so these six themes and then these values, what does that look like then for a food and agriculture paradigm? And so we, we thought, well, it would be one that would be ecologically sustainable. It would be relevant for smallholders. It would meet the needs of, you know, increasing needs for sustainable whole food plant based diets. It would integrate into these social movements that are challenging the corporate food regime. And I think this is the radical part. It would respect and protect the rights of all sentient beings, both human and non-human and of nature. Um, and so we thought, OK, we looked at all these different paradigms. Um, we wanted to put together the best of, you know, uh, of the ecological um, aspects of conservation agriculture, um, the ethical aspects of, of, you know, veganism, I suppose, or, or, or um, shifting our relationship to other animals. Um, we wanted it to be organic. And then we wanted that movement aspect of challenging the corporate food regime and the capitalist food system um, and going for food sovereignty, land and sea justice and localization of agroecology as a movement. So then, yeah, we came up with this mouthful of conservation agriculture based veganic agroecology as one possible vision right, right, right. um because i think you know pluralism is also a really important um right. value and and this is just this is ours but i sort of feel like it's broad enough if we've got these principles uh, it's broad enough for, for all of us to be thinking about you know what how do we want to contribute how can we use this framework as a kind of guiding um, framework for, for for what we want to do in terms of uh, transforming the food system or creating alternatives so yeah that's that's our vision but there's going to be countless others I think right right I appreciate it especially the the pluralism mm -hmm. that, that you talked about because I think that uh, if nothing else that's uh, realistic yes <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> no. I would really like to make everyone do this but no I know it's not yeah yeah <laughs> We're not going to get everyone on the same page, but if we can, you know, mm -hmm. you know, have everyone working out of the same text, you know, that has these things in it, you know, of local control, yeah. sustainability, et cetera. I think that, yeah, yeah, because that is also something we're seeing right now in the, in the political discussions is, 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 is kind of a narrowness that is, you know, self-defeating ultimately to, to, um, to moving forward on things. So, yeah. yeah. So did you want to um, kind of uh, have anything that you wanted to sort of sum up this conversation with or about the book, or if you also wanted to say where um, people can, uh, well, I'll put in the show notes where people can buy the book, but where they can like follow up on this work or, or follow these issues. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, the book is um, published by an academic publisher called El Sevier, which is, um, as many of you probably know, have very, very high prices. Um, so what we've done is, um, because we know that most people are not going to be able to buy the book, it's not accessible for most people, we've created a website at www.inclusiveresponsibility.earth, um, which has got extracts from each of the chapters and it I think it really does have the essence of the book there and it's got the themes it's got the idea of inclusive responsibility um so I think that would be the first stop for people if if, if okay. they're interested mm -hmm. um and you know my aspiration with that website is um to actually do you know author interviews to make these ideas more accessible so like 20 minute overviews of each of the chapters um, and, and also, you know, bringing in, you know, doing interviews with people who, um, you know, and ideas and topics that we didn't manage to get in the book. There's so many that we didn't cover, things like degrowth, things like rewilding, you know, the personal aspect of what does inclusive responsibility look in terms of, you know, our personal, you know, that there's, there's, there's so much that's yet to be explored. Um, so I think that's going to be a living, a, a slowly growing and living website for, for where this journey takes us. 
Um, and if anybody wants any of the individual chapters, um, you can email me at leila.kassam at gmail.com. Okay, great. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciated this conversation. Oh, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.